human things. Peter's mind is on human things. Human things like survival and success. Peter, the disciple who was just named the founding stone of the church, is now a stumbling rock. All because of these human things. Jesus is beginning to prepare his disciples for what lies ahead. It's a turning point in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a turning point in Jesus' ministry. This is the first time that Jesus tells his disciples that he is going to suffer and he is going to die. And Peter can't stand it. Not because Peter is bad or stupid, but because of human things. Peter does not want Jesus to suffer. Peter does not want Jesus to be humiliated and bloodied. Peter does not want Jesus, his friend, his teacher, to die. No, of course not. Peter wants Jesus to be successful. He wants Jesus to be in power. He wants Jesus to change the world. And Peter only knows of one way that that happens. And it certainly isn't by dying. It's by military and imperial and political might. It's by human things. a very human thing to want your friends to live. And it's a very human thing to want to avoid suffering. It's also a very human thing to want control. Right? We want to control our finances. At least I want to control my finances. <laughs> we want to control our environments. We want to control our bodies as best we can. We want to manage our lives and in doing so we often want to keep away that pesky reality that there is so much that we cannot control at all. And so sometimes we also try to control God. To make God's story fit our story. Our story in which God likes all the same people we like hates all the same people we hate. Isn't that convenient? Our story in which we have nice things because God gave them to us. Our story in which good things only ever happen to good people and bad things only ever happen to bad people and there's an order to it. Peter here is trying to control God. Because in Peter's story, God doesn't die. That's completely unacceptable. So Peter pulls Jesus aside and he scolds him. He says, no, Jesus, you've got it wrong. It doesn't happen that way. And I would not want to be Peter in this moment because Jesus does not make
mince words in his response. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Oof. Jesus recalls here his temptation by the devil in the wilderness. Way back at the beginning of his ministry, way back in Matthew chapter 4, the devil tempted Jesus with human things with the powers of immediate satisfaction, fame, and political domination. The devil tempted Jesus with different forms of control. Controls that could lead to some good outcomes. The fame to preach his message far and wide, the political control to construct a society exactly the way he wants it, all for the small price of worshiping evil, of accepting a power that dominates rather than a power that liberates and sets free. Jesus said no then, just as he says no to Peter now. Because Jesus' mind is not on human things. There's a story within the story of the brothers Karamazov called the Grand Inquisitor. I don't know if any of you are familiar. I haven't read it, I'm going to be honest on the list, but I did read the summary that Professor Richard Ward wrote in an essay on today's gospel text. If you're wondering what I'm doing tomorrow, it's, it's reading the Grand Inquisitor itself. The story takes place during the Inquisition. Jesus has returned to earth and is sentenced to death for performing miracles. And the Grand Inquisitor visits the incarcerated Jesus to explain why the church chose to align itself with imperial power. Why the church chose the power that dominates. The Grand Inquisitor says, the church no longer needs you. You were wrong to refuse the power to feed the poor, to perform a miraculous leap from the temple and grab rulership over the world. We picked up where you left off. And we improved on what you started. In fact, we corrected your mistake. Yes, it was necessary to use the devil's principles to do so, but we do it in the name of God. Jesus says nothing. And he simply kisses the Grand Inquisitor. Human things. Those things we do in the name of God that have nothing to do with God and everything to do with us. Now, I don't think all human things are bad. There are some really lovely ones, aren't there? And I, I actually think Jesus would agree. He was human after all. He had a human life. Human love. A really good meal, a compassionate touch. But this human thing of control at any cost, this human thing where we try to fit God to our story rather than trying to find ourselves within God's story, that's where we stumble. 
Jesus says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. These are famous words. They are challenging words, maybe even frightening words, because what a daunting task Jesus sets before us. What a radical task. And we live in a world where we're rarely told to deny ourselves. In fact, we're often told the opposite. Treat yourself. Pursue your dreams. Get exactly what you want. And I want to be clear, I, I don't believe that self-denial means some complete negation of our needs, or our dreams, or our desires, but I do think it means taking them and examining them in the light of divine things. And what are those divine things? Jesus doesn't exactly provide a list. But he does preach the Sermon on the Mount, in which he tells us that the poor, the grieving, the hungry, and the peacemakers are the blessed ones. And in which he tells us to treasure not material items, but those intangible things that will last far beyond this life we have on earth. And Jesus does tell some parables in which he tells us to bear good fruit and reminds us that a little faith can do great things. And God does send messengers, like the Apostle Paul, who in today's text from Romans offers us some guidance on divine things. He writes, let love be genuine. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Live in harmony. Do not repay evil for evil. Paul uses a Greek word here, anipokritos. Let love be anipokritos. It means unhypocritical. Love people without hypocrisy, Paul says. Part of what it means to hold our choices and our actions up to the light of divine things means to look for our own hypocrisy. To notice when we as Christians are trying to bend God's story to our own will. God has such a beautiful story to tell. It's a story of grace and forgiveness, of love and second chances of life that conquers death. It's a good story. It's the best one I know. It's a story where all people flourish, and like that song that Mary and Ingrid sang, a story where all people find a safe place. That's what God wants. All people to flourish, not just all of us here in this sanctuary, not just all the ones who go to church, all people. And that, that just can't happen without some self-denial. Look at the wealth gap, right? Look at where gun violence is concentrated in our city. Look at who and what has driven climate change and who and where are suffering its worst impacts as I speak. I mean, the truth of the matter is there are people who live in self-denial every day out of necessity. 
And there are those for whom it is very much a choice. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, we have to put the cross before the crown. We have to follow where Jesus goes. Jesus goes to the poor. Jesus goes to the sick. Jesus goes to the suffering. Jesus goes to the halls of power and tells hard truths. Jesus goes to dinner with the people who never get invited. Jesus goes to the borders. Jesus goes to the injection site. Jesus goes to the migrant shelter. Jesus goes to the areas that are devastated by wildfires. Jesus goes to the jails and the prisons. Jesus goes to the capital and says, you hypocrites. You who worship at the altar of violence while children cower beneath their desks in fear. Jesus goes to the under-resourced schools and Jesus goes to the hospital and Jesus goes to the funeral homes and the graveyards and Jesus goes to the tent city. Jesus goes. And we must follow. Even when it costs us something to do so. It's hard to remember the divine things. It's hard to notice our own hypocrisy. Which is why we come to the table. This act, communion, it's a place of remembering. Remembering divine things and remembering ourselves, putting ourselves back together in the promise of God's forgiveness. <laughs>